sorry. Um, but nevertheless, I thought it was um, important that um, we discuss, or I at least present some of the, um, these findings that we've made quite recently. But before I actually do that, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about what we're doing here at UWA with the new node that we've now set up. Um, we've got a group of students, um, three students, PhD students, Jesse, Taryn and, and Sana. And they've got some um, pretty interesting field sites. The Sana's working up in Signet Bay, looking at corals under very extreme conditions, 35 degrees, 10 metre tides and crocodiles. Um, Ningaloo Reef, we're working at, at Coral Bay, and that's kind of a common site. All the students are working there, doing some of their experiments. Um, Taryn's uh, concentrating on um, Ningaloo Reef, which is, I mean, sorry, at Abrolis Islands down here. And Jesse um, is um, looking at coralline algae across this whole range. So we've got, um, we're trying to actually look at the whole, the question we're addressing is the whole gradient along our WA coast and trying to figure out what's happening with the coral reef uh, processes. We've also got some postdocs, uh, Jim Falter, who'll be giving a talk uh, later this morning, uh, Delphine, um, she's joined us from France, and we've got a new postdoc uh, joined as part of the super science uh, scheme, and Michael Holcomb is um, the fourth who's on the way to be here um, uh, later this year. So the, as I mentioned, the kind of things we're trying to do is we're actually doing some direct measurements of of calcification rates for, coralline, for corals and coralline algae. Uh, coupled with this, we're measuring intensively the water chemistry characteristics, so we can try and relate the calcification to what's happening in the water. Um, we're also doing geochemical measurements, which I'll be talking about in particular. We're starting to do these boron measurements, and then when the new facilities, mesocosm, things are going at, at, at Watermans, which is another 12 months away though, and we plan to um, continue on with that. So this is just an example of some of the classic um, calcification and algal recruitment uh, study looks like. Um, okay, so now I'll get on to my talk. And so I'm going to, um, and, and I should say what we're doing in the field is in a sense a precursor. We're trying to test some of the hypotheses that this study's generated. In the next few years, we'll be testing them directly in the field and with mesocosms and aquaria, well, mesocosm experiments as well. So I'm going to talk about the issue of coral calcification and sensitivity to climate change. And actually, in the detail I'll be looking at, I hope it's not too much detail, is the physiological control of pH, uh, seawater pH on calcification. I'll be uh, talking about a proxy that we've used and I've described before to this audience, at least some of you, about how we've used boron isotopes to get long-term trends in seawater pH. But what I'll be doing this today is to actually show you how we can use it to look at internal physiological controls on calcification. And then the interesting thing, we'll be taking that, those results, um, putting them into future scenarios and looking the, at the effect of ocean acidification combined with global warming or what we can think about as an ideal coral system, how it may respond. All right. So the well-known problem is that, um, this is a slide from Ken Caldera, if, if we um, burn all the carbon we can get our hands on, we'll push up CO2 up into several thousand ppm level. And the um, kind of problem we faced is that the, mes the experiments that have been done looking at the effect of the CO2 on the saturation state of the oceans is that it'll drop it from around four, four and a half down at least several units. And the experimental data suggests, actually the newer data, and I'll show more data, should does suggest, some data suggests strong sensitivity, i.e. decreases in calcification by over factors of two. Other data is less sensitive. So we've been trying to understand this process. And the key thing, of course, is the detail, what, how do the corals actually calcify? Now, what I'm giving here is just a very superficial kind of um, overview. It's well known that um, corals make, actually, this space here that I've shown is actually a few microns in actual uh, depth. And in this environment, they um, bring in calcium and they manipulate the bicarbonate system uh, to produce carbonate ions so they can actually, at, at some interface with, with a lot of uh, making templates for the architecture of this, this skeleton and, uh, and so on, they can um, precipitate their, eventually precipitate the coral skeleton. But it, of course, they need energy. With, this is showing the um, zosenthalia and there's sequences of uh, 
the cell systems that buffer the, buffer the calcification site from seawater. So we know that this is a typical seawater range, and it's been quite well known actually that this space in here, the internal pH, is, being, is greater than seawater. Um, but how much was never very well understood. We knew this had to be the case because that had to be the mechanism they had to elevate their saturation state so they could actually calcify. So what I'm saying now is a pretty conventional view. I should say also that to increase their pH, it's been well known that they eventually, essentially remove hydrogen ions using these pumps, this calcium ATPase pump, which pulls out hydrogen ions. In return, it brings in some calcium to, run, to keep the charge balanced. So this is one of the major mechanisms for modifying the pH. Now, of course, pH, why are we worried about it? This is, again, a well-known issue. And the problem, of course, is that the, the acidification process is shifting the distribution of carbonate ion, the critical component for calcification. As you reduce the pH, um, that carbonate ion decreases, and, in fact, the bicarbonate increases. Now, the, uh, and this shows, and this is a kind of a scenario, if you double uh, CO2, you can see the carbonate ion can can decrease from over 220 or to almost a half. So that's quite a significant decrease in carbonate ion for increasing CO2. And that's been the driver of the concern about acidification. <coughs> and this is, of course, a concern for deep sea corals as well as shallow water corals. Now, matching the carbonate bicarbonate equilibria, we have another equilibria that gives us pH. And this is the borate boric acid equilibria. And this is, and these, and I'll show you, this equilibria has an isotope signature, and we can monitor the shift of pH using boron as that pH decreases in the changing isotopic composition of boron. So this is pretty well known in the geochemical business. So what happens then is that um, the, the corals tend to take up, we think, only this borate form, and as the pH drops, the boron isotope composition will decrease and it's given in this notation um, relative to um, some standard. And this fractionation is actually quite large. The seawater is 40 per mil, and there's over a 20 per mil fractionation, in which in terms of isotope geochemistry, we can measure this very, to a tenth of a per mil very, quite easily. So we can measure these changes quite accurately, and we spend a lot of time developing methods to do this very precisely and accurately. And what we found is that, so, um, there's been a little bit of debate about what this curve is, but there's now been new data, both experimentally and theoretically, and it's, and it's been kind of known that, interestingly, a lot of corals tend to lie above that curve, right? Um, and so what does that mean? Well, it means that they've <coughs> elevated their pH. So this would represent the seawater pH here. When we go measure the boron, we find it's above it, and in fact it's elevated by this difference here, you take that line across, the difference between the two is what we call the delta pH. So get to remember this, and this is the elevation of pH that we believe is done internally by the coral. And now the kind of finding that we've made is that um, if you look at this delta pH, how much they elevate versus the seawater pH, this shows there's now we've discovered and measured remarkable correlation in this change of delta pH. It's very, as you can see, there's highly correlated, um, so over pH ranges from, this is normal seawater, these are down to about 7.6. Um, you can get linear arrays in this space, which tells you that the delta pH changes in proportion to the seawater pH, and in fact increases, right? So the, the coral is elevating its pH internally um, at a greater amount as the pH of the seawater decreases. So these, these data come from not only our lab, but other labs shown here. And the species are, are shown up here. There's a cropper, a parietes, and these other things are mostly these um, foramps. So um, I'll talk a bit, so, but I should say not all things do this, right? So foramps, these particular species have a delta pH of zero. And that means they don't modify their internal pH. So they, they're actually dependent directly on the seawater changes. But the corals have this buffering mechanism. And it's actually been known by the people doing uh, this bit of microsensor um, work and recently some dye work by Van Edel. And they're getting the same <laughs> delta pH shifts of about 0.6 of a unit at typical seawater pH. But no one yet has 
got this slope. So what we've discovered is that uh, not only do they elevate, but as you decrease the seawater pH, the delta increases. So the slope is about minus a half to a two thirds, and there's a species offset. Depending on the species, depends on how much they elevate it. <coughs> so what? Back to our basic understanding then of what's happening with calcification. Um, we've now found that okay, you have seawater pH. We can now predict what the internal pH will be. Um, it's going to be about 8.5 to 9, depending on the particular species of coral. Um, so, the, what we're saying in a sense that the, this, this relationship, this, the difference in pH between this space in here where they calcify and the seawater is that there's a gradient that they control and they do this biologically, probably using these ATPase pumps to do it. And the gradient is roughly a half. It's kind of a nice, there's other theoretical reasons why, why this may be so. So, and the... Um, and there's a species effect as well, how much they elevate it. So what that gives us then, we, we know the pH. The question is, can we get the saturation state? Well, actually, we need to make an assumption about the source of carbon into this space. But if we assume that process remains unchanged, we can then move forward and make some estimates of what the uh, internal uh, saturation state is. So remember, the external saturation state of seawater is typically 3.5 to 4.5. And this is what most of the people have been focusing on. What I'm going to now change is that we're going to focus differently. We're going to look now at the internal saturation state at the site of calcification. That's what really matters to the coral. Oops. All right. So when we now look at, calculate the internal saturation state over a range of PCO2, this actually goes out to 1,000 um, ppm. And we're assuming here that the, this, you can look at, think of this as being atmospheric or but the water being in equilibrium with that um, concentration. We see that the saturation state is around about 20 um, for assuming double, uh, DIC is doubled. And these are the different species evolutions that, that we have. Um, seawater is down here, as I showed. So as you increase PCO2, the seawater would decrease from um, typically three or four down to less than, less than one. So you get... In relative terms, this, the seawater uh, saturation state is dropping quite dramatically. Evidence can sort of confirming this higher internal saturation state. This is a paper by Cullen and Holcomb. Um, they've actually um, looked at crystal morphology and suggested saturation states around 15 to 20. So our calculations, well, I shouldn't say, our, our, our models based on the boron isotope data are quite consistent with what you actually <coughs> see in the internal structure of corals as well. So, um, so let's move forward on that. So we can use that evidence then and ask the question, well, how does that affect if we now assume that the calcification is essentially now an inorganic abiotic process but with internally modified saturation state? This is a well-known equation that um, people are familiar with. It's the calcification is essentially dependent on omega minus one, but except here, in contrast to other people, we're now using internal om omega, not the seawater. We're using the coral internal omega or saturation, which is a key thing. We can then run a calculation for different omegas externally for the seawater, and this is what we predict as a sensitivity uh, for changing seawater saturation state. So what we, and there are in fact quite a lot of experimental data that supports this. So what we conclude now is that the higher sensitivity coral data is likely to be an artefact. Um, some species, however, do not upregulate pH. And in fact, a lot of coralline algae lie along this high sensitivity curve. But most uh, aragonitic corals, I'm using these words quite carefully, we think now have much lower sensitivity to changing aragonite saturation due to this ability to upregulate their internal uh, pH and thereby their internal saturation state. We can now just continue this modelling. So if we um, see how, what the effect of changing atmospheric CO2 is and look at the relative change, this is a relative change relative to today, and ask, OK, if we increase the CO2, what would the effect be? We would get a decrease because it is actually, as I said, the pH is linked to the change in seawater, but only at roughly half the amount. The gradient's about a half. This is what we predict for the decrease, about... 25%, still significant. But you notice, however, if you take this back into the last glacial maximum, where, where seawater 
PCO2 was about 200, we would have predicted a decrease in calcification since then. We know that's not happened, and the reason is, of course, um, there's been warming as well. So, you know, we know that CO2, um, this is the level. We know, of course, that associated with that is warming. So we have to take that up into account as well. So the CO2 increase is accompanied by warming. And if you do that, put and those terms, I didn't explain it, but in the, the calcification terms also are temperature enhanced. So if we now put um, uh, sort of a relatively simple um, uh, term for allowing for increased warming, so you can get roughly two degree warming by 1,000 ppm, then we'd actually predict that the calcification rates would increase uh, relative to what they are today and actually would explain the expansion of corals from the last glacial maximum to the present day because the temperature effect would have, would have overcome the effect of that decreased PCO2. So, um, but of course, um, life isn't that simple, right? We know that there's many other factors that affect corals. In particular, we've heard about bleaching from Luke, and this model, what we're assuming is that the temperature effect um, is just enhancing calcification, and there's no other physiological negative, right? There's not, you know, the coral's perfectly adapted and, and, it's, and it's not being bleached. If it bleached, it can't calcify because it has no energy. So just to emphasise that point, you know, we've been just looking at this acidification with some temperature, but of course the other things we have to worry about are the local impacts on that coral system. But what I'm saying is in effect kind of reinforcing Luke's point is that if we have a healthy coral system, um, they can, I think, now um, overcome to a large extent the effects of acidification as long as the temperature forcing isn't too... as long as you do not get repeated bleaching, for example, right? So any physiological damage will, of course, negate this idea, but conceptually, in, in concept at least, um, the acidification effect is much reduced to what people have previously thought. So in, in conclusion, we believe now that there's you know, that this ability to upregulate internal pH relative to the ambient seawater provides greater resilience. We're obviously going to test this a lot more. This is the first cut of the data we've got. Um, so we'll be spending the next few years trying to make sure across a wide range of environments this is true. We can actually now with this kind of, we now have a function that relates external seawater changes to what's happening internally. We can model at a species specific level responses to processes such as acidification and temperature. But just to emphasise again, we're assuming in those outcomes normal functionality, um, rising sea surface temperatures with this upregulation ability can partially ameliorate the effects of acidification. I think this is a good news story. I think we now have some hope for reefs. I think if we look after our reefs, we can now look to a better future, but it's a key thing about managing the process. But also, I guess, the underlying problem, I think, is going to come down to this thermal stress and bleaching and their rate of adaption. That will be the, probably the key limit now that will, I, in my view now, limit the, um, the resilience of coral reefs to future changes. Because as I'll talk about tonight, um, this summer in WA, we had a very rapid extreme thermal event that can devastate, of course, reefs, depending on their ability to recover, as, as Luke just mentioned. So with that, I'll... Um, Finished. Thanks very much.